coffee with cat on lap hey everybody welcome back today i'm going to be over, going over a song by nine inch nails called right where it belongs now it's taken me a while to graduate from i guess my teenage concept of angst and flair and rebellion to appreciate this band especially when it comes to the lyrics and the layers of lyrics which i'm going to go over today i did read their one book called into the never and unfortunately the author's name escapes me right now, but it's back there, and I'll put it down in the reference section below, so that way you'll have an idea of where I'm, where I'm coming from. This band has had a message for a while, and on face value, they can be seen as rather anti-everything, just rage, and if you ever saw them perform, like back in the 90s, especially in the 2000s, maybe a little bit less, they were quite angry at each other. At one point, I heard about Trent Reznor coaching one of the people he was playing with because the person thought he messed up uh, on the keyboards or something, and Trent Reznor's like, hey, it's not A, then B, it's F, then U. And so he's trying to, you know, get the whole feel of the music out there as they were playing live. And their live concerts are amazing. Uh, Trent Reznor is one of the characters that really saw what was coming as far as, like, Napster and all the digital age of the music. And he invested himself into, like, soundtracks of movies, soundtracks of video games. Put himself where people you know, kind of had to purchase that to, to get the whole feel and the ambiance to it. So that was really cool. I'm going to go over this one song called Right Where It Belongs. And I'm going to go over the song because, again, I think every single sto every single story, every single song that we have anything that pulls interest to you or to me has to have that kind of hero element, even if it's in the negative or that hero's journey kind of element to it because that is what we're all here for. We're looking for things that pique our interest. We're looking for a little bit of the unknown to delve into. So this song is not the happiest song. It's at the end of their With Teeth album. And I'm going to recite the lyrics and then I'm going to kind of pull apart the layers a little bit and go and, and see there, there's multiple, there's like two tiers of three layers to this song, which is really cool. So if you have not listened to this song, check below down there in the description and it should tell you or give you a link to where you can go listen to it. Maybe that'll get you in the mood. I don't know. If not, you could just take it as I say it out. Now, I was talking to a person today. Uh, he's a newer guy at work, and we were talking about Nine Inch Nails, and he's like, yeah, I listened to them in my teenage years. I'm like, what do you listen to now? He said, well, I listen to Japanese rock. I'm like, really? You speak Japanese? He's like, no, but sometimes they go in English. I'm like, that's very interesting that you're listening to music that fuels you, that you don't know what they're articulating. You know, feeling starts out, I guess earlier in the evolutionary perspective, you know, carnality and the draws of lust and hunger and thirst, and that, that keeps life going, sure, but after a while, when consciousness kicks in, you should probably know exactly what you're listening to. I don't know, but he seemed to not mind a little bit, and then we start talking philosophy, and that that's good. But anyway, this is why I go through these songs. It's important to know what you're feeding yourself, because that is what you're doing. One of the first talks I ever gave had to deal with, you will become passionate based on what you expose yourself to. And that's the choice, right? That's almost like marriage. You, if you're doing a marriage properly, you will love your wife. If you're doing it right, you should love your wife and you'll love her specifically or him specifically because you made a decision. You're exposing yourself to them. You're choosing to do that for a long period of time. Bands can be the same way. That's just another rabbit hole we can go down, but I'm gonna stick with this song, okay? So it goes like this. See the animal in his cage that you built. Are you sure what side you're on? Better not look him too closely in the eye. Are you sure what side of the glass you are on? See the safety of the life you have built, everything where it belongs. Feel the hollowness inside of your heart, and it's all right where it belongs. What if everything around you isn't quite as it seems? What if all the world you think you know is an elaborate dream? And if you look at your reflection, is it all you want it to be? What if you could look right through the cracks? Would you find yourself, find yourself afraid to see? The second verse. What if all the worlds inside of your head, just creations of your own, your devils and your gods, all the living and the dead, and you really are alone? You can live in this illusion. You can choose to believe. You keep looking, but you can't find the woods while you're hiding in the trees. What if everything around you isn't quite as it seems? What if all the world you used to know is an elaborate dream? And if you look at your reflection, is it all you want it to be? What if you could look right through the cracks? Would you find yourself, find yourself afraid to see? So that's pretty heavy. Uh, this song tells a story, but it's a story about introspection. And it's not a story about introspection. It's also a story about a, well, a lot of things. The only way you can know this is, first off, you have to get the whole song in your head. And like many of the, well, I guess, modern as well as old poets, when they have thick lyrics and they have thick meaning to unpack, you really got to wrap your head around it. So I forget when the album With Teeth came out, but it was a bit ago. I haven't been listening to it all the time, but I tell you what, this one came up. 
I listen to Nine Inch Nails and Tool on like spin cycle. Whenever I'm, I, I play Magic the Gathering. Whenever I'm building my decks, because I don't have to like totally listen to the articulation. Like I, I don't listen to a talk, like a philosophy talk or anything like that. Uh, but I can listen to music while I make my deck because you're trying to you know build a little algorithmic story there on in your magic deck. But that's another topic. So we're gonna start at the top here. See the animal in his cage that you built. Are you sure what side you're on? So that immediately points to maybe like the difference between this little this little dude on my lap and myself. One is an animal who was put in a cage. I put him in the cage. Sure. This sounds out. This sounds quite simple to start with, but there's layers here. And we have to focus and pay attention. It's got to start somewhere. So I envision like a lion, not necessarily like this guy. Better not look him too closely in the eye. Are you sure what side of the glass you're on? When you think of the world from a pure evolutionary perspective and you take out the spiritual realm, you are no different than the animal you put in a cage. You just happen to be a little smarter. That's it. Otherwise, you're just a stepping stone to wherever life is going to choose to evolve to. And that's cold and desolate. Better not look him too closely in the eye. Are you sure what side of the glass you're on? Because maybe you're just kind of locking yourself into your own ordered world while he is actually out there in the wild doing what evolution is supposed to do. Don't look him too closely in the eye because then you might figure out him and you are on the same playing field. See the safety of the life you have built, everything where it belongs. Feel the hollowness inside of your heart and it's all right where it belongs. So this appeals to order and structure. In the hero story that Joseph Campbell goes on about, you start out in the known. And eventually what you want to do is go through the unknown so you get change and come back. And that's, the, that's every hero story ever. So this kind of appeals to that in a sense. If you have your life totally ordered, with no hiccups whatsoever, all your pains are mastered, you don't age anymore, what you will do, and this is from Tolstoy, I believe, you'll pick up something and smash something. So you'll smash the cornerstone just for something to do, just so something interesting might happen. And that's what do they call it? agency in the negative. This is actually replete in the biblical stories. Whenever Israel gets too affluent, they forget where they came from. They take everything for granted. You could see this in like spoiled children. The other way this appeals is if you already know everything, you already know these animals are, and yourself are just on the evolutionary stepping scale. There's this uh, the book that C.S. Lewis wrote called The Pilgrim's Regress. And he talk, it's basically an allegorical story about he discover, him discovering Christ, going from atheism to theism. It's a very good read. If, even if you're not a theist or an atheist, it's, it's really, the pictures in there are very well done. In the beginning of the story, he pictured, well, toward the beginning, there's this giant, there's this giant, it's, it's the spirit of the age. It throws him into a cage where you can just see out of like, like it's a, it's a black cage, but you can see out of like a little peephole. And every time the spirit of the age looks at them, they can see through their hand and they can see their veins and their organs and their skulls and they can see everybody else's. And then they despair. Woe are we, for we are undone. Because the spirit of the age, which is led to the modern feel of the world, is we already know everything there is to know about us. Everything is ordered. Science has proven everything. Look, you can see everything about yourself. You're all chemical reactions in your brain. And when you already know that, you're almost like horrified. You're like, I'm a machine and that's all I am. There's nothing underneath. That's a totally ordered universe. The other re reason why this is, this is, this is the multi-layer part of it. In the biblical stories, when they pitch Satan versus Christ, Satan does not adhere to any higher rule. He is his own rules, like self-referencing. But there is a higher rule. And then Christ, you could, Christ does appeal to something higher than himself, and that's the Father. Satan is the 100% the ordered world. There's nothing left to know. I already know it all. So that's all I am. That's a, there's, there's nothing greater than me. But if there's something greater, if there's something always to be known, then there's always adventure. And this is per Nietzsche. Men crave danger and adventure. Or was it danger and challenge? I'm sorry if I got that incorrect, all you Nietzsche scholars out there. So the song goes on. What if everything around you isn't quite as it, as it seems? What if all the world you think you know is an elaborate dream? And if you look at your reflection, is it all you want it to be? Ah, so this changes the song. Instead of glass, now you're looking at a reflection. This is like the second second tier part of it. And this is also putting doubt in even that. It's like the undergirding doubt in the back of your mind that nihilism exists. There, this might not be worth anything or it might not even be real. And then you're like, what is real? But that just keeps it in the 
kind of like the realm of reality. We keep it right here. And you look at reflection, is that all you want it to be? So that's also your self-reflection. You're looking at yourself and all the structure you want. Can't you be more? Or are you fine with things being as ordered as they are? As far as I can tell, whenever you hit that point of like everything being ordered, you don't want adventure anymore, that's when you die. That's when death is on your doorstep. That's why the American dream of this whole concept of getting rich, getting millions, and never working again a day in your life, never doing anything significant, never op like that, never offering yourself to a higher cause than maybe yourself or something greater. Well, what are you living for? Yourself? You know your flesh is going to part this world. So you're identifying yourself with death in a sense. And that's your reflection. You are that... Instead of looking straight at the animal, you're now looking at yourself and the cage you built and the ordered, structured life around you. I got all these books back here. They don't structure me in. They try to help me move out. The whole point of education, educating yourself, and now we have this brilliant thing called YouTube and the internet, is to help you live better. Because truth is assumed most of the time with agendas not being pushed. That's the whole point of the Bible um, and the C.S. Lewis Institute right now. We're going through uh, studying about the end times. I think it's important. I, it's tough for me to find it interesting because Christ tells you how to live your life right now. He doesn't point to the end times and say, look, they're coming. He gives you principle to live by. He tells you the ends will come, sure. I mean, ends do come. This is entropy, if anything, will tell you this. But Christ's biggest words were to appeal to being itself. In order to grow, you need to aim up. And perhaps I'm appealing a little bit too much to Christ in a Nine Inch Nails song. But it is there, right? You're looking at your reflection. Where are you going? Are you? Is that all you want it to be? Can it be better? Well, is it just going to be a prettier version of yourself? Or are we going somewhere with this? That kind of question. What if you could look right through the cracks? Would you find yourself... Find yourself afraid to see. This This is one of the killer lines right here. The, so the cracks, what, in the mirror? The cracks in yourself? The cracks in the animal? That is the pure unknown. That's the void. So if you look through those, you look in, you look past all your structured life. Where would you go? Would you find yourself if you went in there? Or would you hesitate and just stay and double down on your structured life? And that's finding yourself afraid to see to see that's two different statements find yourself find yourself afraid to see obviously in the song but it's that hesitation mark which is also one of his albums later on there it's almost like a running theme because the void can be so paralyzing it's like staring at the sea will she come and that's another nine nails song the sea and the vastness and the void and space and and I mean, we're playing the game Subnautica right now as a family, and that thing is just scary, and it's not even real, but it scares the crap out of my kids when a giant monster comes and tries to eat me. But that's the overcoming. That's knowing you have to jump off the ledge. It's going to happen. If anything, a force is going to push you off, and you can say that's your immortality. I don't know. So are you ready to go in there? Maybe you should prepare yourself a little bit more. And that's finding yourself afraid to see. Maybe I'm just not ready to go in there just yet. That's the proper way to look at it. Maybe I'm not mature yet. Maybe I need to research this a little more. Maybe i got to find out if I'm on the right path before I go that deep into the void. Or, if we're still thinking in more of an evolutionary paradigm, if I crack myself open, what's in there? Maybe you don't want to go far down deep into yourself. Because the further down into yourself you can go, where, where, where exactly is that? And that's like Tool's reflection song. It's extreme narcissism because if you just live this direction, that's pretty much proven not to work. That's anarchy because then everybody believes in themselves hardcore if you listen to your lusts and everything else. That's what happens when you throw away the transcendent perspective. Uh, Nietzsche saw this in his uh, Madman poem specifically. What of all the worlds inside of your head, just creations of your own, your devils and your gods, all the living and the dead, and you really are alone. So this is the third layer. So the first layer was glass and then no the glass is actually a mirror and now it's just the the lens which you see through it's like it takes it back a step so now you're not even seeing the shell of yourself you went inside yourself through that crack now you're doubting your own senses so how do you prove your senses work well there's one thing that people will rarely if ever deny and that is their own pain pain usually helps you realize things are real if anything because you just don't want to die pain hurts pain is bad and that's again agency in the negative that's something that you pull back from. That whatever that was, let's see if we can be proactive and not do it again. You know, that kind of thing. And if this is what you're living for, this deep introspective person, 
the person that broods, the person who lives for himself, who has maybe an agenda, and the outside is just, you know, part of that illusion where this is a is real, then you really kind of would be alone. The other layer of this is, if you ever read The Good Like Archipelago, there's a part in there where Solzhenitsyn, it's it's the communist camp over in Soviet Russia. Solzhenitsyn goes into this a little bit, where he, he talks about the concept of Marxist scholars, when they would enter the gulag. Because even though everybody in there hated it, it was hell, cold, death, hell, you would still have people come in there who were narked on by their fellow citizens, claiming how good the system is even though they were being tortured, even though they were starving to death, even though they were losing limbs, they would still say how great the system is. You could not argue against them. They were Marxist scholars, and they just had a fun with them for a little while. And then they actually kind of got bored with them because they were su such automatons. They were so brainwashed by patriotism, etc. They were no longer an individual. They were part of the herd, and they still had that comforting herd mentality that they just kind of sunk into because they didn't know where else to go. And that's another kind of illusion you can live in if you're not careful, if you're not having a relationship with what you're aiming at. You know, you don't question the system. You just, you know, hunker down. Everything will be fine. Someone will take care of it. That's a heroless world if you're not questioning things, if you're not being a little bit skeptical of things as they come to you. And it goes on. You can live in this illusion. You can choose to believe. You keep looking, but you can't find the woods while you're hiding in the trees. So believing is a choice, and whatever you choose to believe in is also a choice. This is a David Hume thing. Again, I bring him up a bit because it's just so relevant. You can't get an ought from an is. Just because things are a certain way won't tell you how to live. So you're down in the depths. It's a godless world. What do you do? Well, I'll make things better. Why? Because I think things will get better. I think, I think maybe a lack of pain will be better. Well, why is that? People tend to live better with a lack of pain. Says who? Well, says the girl next door when, you know, you eventually you'll get down to a specific example, and the example's a story, and it's a character, it's a person. So you can believe it's an illusion. You can believe reality is what it is, because, I don't know, pain exists. You can believe there's a transcendent perspective, because that's also what this is kind of questioning. You created everything, not something else. You made all this, and all the perspective you have, it's right here. There's not absolute perspective. And that's another choice to believe in that, believing in that absolute perspective. And then the last line before the refrain again, you keep looking, but you can't find the woods while you're hiding in the trees. This is a picture, I think, at least this last line, of somebody hiding. So They, wanna, they don't even want to see the reflection anymore. They want things as ordered as they could possibly be. That way, they don't have to deal with adversity, that they don't have to deal with pain. Because when you go out on adventure, when you go into the unknown, you might get hurt. Actually, there's a strong possibility you will. And then not only will you get hurt, you might get scarred. But then you'll come back stronger, or you might get changed. Christ said that if something causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, lest it drag you into hell. So when you go to the unknown and you're going down into the, the changing depths of the unknown, which is life, which is adventure, which is death itself, let go of something that's keeping you there and preventing you from moving on. And if you choose not to do that, if you choose to hold on to that tree in the woods, even though you're looking for something bigger, it'll be impossible to find. What if everything around you isn't quite as it seems? What if all the world you used to know is an elaborate dream? And if you look at your reflection, is it all you want it to be? What if you could look right through the cracks? Would you find yourself afraid to see? Cat! I went the whole way around the house just to knock on that door get my attention. I love him. So this part right here as we get to the end of the song, he's questioning if everything around you isn't quite as it seems. So it's again revisiting the concept of the value of order and all the world that you used to know is an elaborate dream. So now that we're in the what metaphysical woods and we know that we're trying to look for something greater, how do we get out of this? And whose dream is it? Is it mine or is it something out here? If we're looking for something, a transcendent perspective, where do we have to go? Well, we can kind of layer that upon our own heads. But reality and life has been around for quite a while. Maybe there's something that's greater than all that, too. And then back to the introspect, back to peeking through the cracks, finding yourself or finding yourself afraid to see. That's taking the plunge. That's finding anxiety. That's understanding where adventure can take you and what to grasp onto and what to aim for. 
Because the model that we have for materialism really isn't all that enchanting. Once we have all our needs met, that's when affluence kicks in. That's when we start destroying ourselves because we don't know where we came from. We need challenge and we need danger. Specifically, men, we need that stuff. We, and what could be more dangerous and challenging than protecting life? Christ said that no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for another. That's a, that sounds extremely noble as far as I can tell. And the principles, I will keep coming back to this, even though this is themed on Irish Nails, the principles that Christ taught this is not advocating for the church per se, although it has its place. Things that Christ taught give you the strength you need to go on that adventure, go on that void. As he went first. And he is the best story, he is the best character that's ever been given to mankind, as far as I can tell. Anyway, that's my rendition of this song. I hope you liked it, hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to see more in the future down below. It helps me out a lot, especially if you want to see more of this guy. He'll be here every day with me. Thanks for watching. Take care.